Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Grant Thornton's webinar on jump-starting the Indian automotive sector, challenges and opportunities post-COVID-19. I am Siddharth Nigam, and I'm the National Managing Partner for Growth Advisory at Grant Thornton India. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, the auto sector in India is at, a, at an inflection point. The sector was already reeling under converging pressures from demand slowdown, unutilized capacity, and regulatory challenges, and now is passing through some very challenging times due to the ongoing crisis around COVID-19. Today, we have a distinguished panel of speakers from the auto industry. It will be great to get their perspective and insights on what the sector needs to do to emerge stronger and get back on its feet. We're sure that you will benefit immensely from the discussion that we plan to have for the next hour and a half. What's the way ahead for the sector? Uh, again, uh, the, you know, I'm not uh, either an economist or an auto sector expert, but uh, if we look at various growth projection scenarios for the auto sector based on FY21 GDP growth, we understand the sector will have to brace for a very challenging year ahead. In January 2020, the outlook for FY21 was a growth of anywhere between 2 to 4% for the various segments within the sector. Post COVID-91, due to the extreme pressure on the economy, if GDP growth falls marginally to 4%, the sector is likely to see a decline of about 13%. In case the GDP growth slows down to any, you know, close to 1%, the sector is likely to have a massive decline of about 20% in sales. I don't want to be pessimistic, but going by any of the scenarios, most likely after the end of the year, the sector will face two consecutive years of double digit decline in sales, which I don't think the sector has seen in the last two decades. Uh, we believe to overcome these challenges, the companies need to focus on some of the items I already alluded to, managing shop floor and manufacturing excellence practices, ensure effective risk management for business continuity, redesign the supply chain and vendor risk assessment, balance liquidity and cost of capital, and of course, tap into new markets. We will talk about some of these in today's session uh, by the, the panelists. Uh, with this, I would like to now hand over to my colleague uh, and partner, Saket Nehra, who also leads the automotive sector at Drum Thornton India. Thank you. Saket, over to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, very good evening to all of you and a very warm welcome to the webinar. I'll be your host uh, for the session, and I'll be joined by an extreme uh, uh, panelist of industry experts, uh, which I'll quickly introduce over the next few minutes. The way we have structured this entire uh, seminar is that uh, webinar is that we'll first uh, have a quick introduction about the panelist. We'll just set the context. We'll bring Dr. Tim talk about the China recovery story, and then we'll move on to a panel discussion. So I'll just quickly introduce uh, all the panelists, uh, starting uh, with the lady first. We have uh, Julian. Mac uh, Julian leads um, the internal controls uh, and compliances at Tata Motors. Her role is and is a chartered member of the British Institute of Internal Auditors and is embarking on a PhD in the subject governance and internal control. Welcome, Julian. We also have Dr. Tim Clatte. Uh, Tim is a partner in the in auto industry expert at Grand Thought in China. He holds over 25 years of experience, out of which uh, 14 years have been with the, legal, with the leading global accounting firms. Dr. Tim has recently contributed an article talking about his perspective uh, based on the China's uh, SARS experience. Uh, welcome, Dr. Tim. It would be very exciting for all of us to hear from you. We also have Vivek uh, Vikram Singh. Uh, Vivek is the Managing Director and Group CEO of uh, Sona Comstar. His role is to create an auto components and systems platform that is focused on bringing value to customers through leveraging existing and emerging technologies, especially EVs and hybrid. He was also recently adjudged by the Economic Times as one of the India's 40, under 40 hottest business leaders uh, in 2018 edition. Many congratulations, Vikram, for that, uh, though belated. We have Amit Gupta. Amit is uh, the President of Business Excellence at Uno Minda. He has over 25 years of experience with close to 23 years spent in the automotive industry. In his current role, he is responsible for driving excellence in manufacturing, materials, EHS, and program management functions across the group. Welcome, Amit. We then have Dr. NK, Mr. N.K. Taneja. Mr. Taneja is a financial consultant and an auto industry expert. He has vast and diversified experience of more than 41 years and has worked at senior positions at LNT to uh, Philips and the other auto companies. Welcome, Mr. Taneja. 
We then have Mr. Ramashankar Pandey. Um, Ramashankar is the managing director at Hela India Lighting Limited. He has more than 22 years of experience in the auto component industry, both in OEM and aftermarket. As a Bosch and Timken alumni, his core area of interest is technology and people development. He is also an EC member and chairman of aftermarket committee at ACMA and is also on the governing council of ASDC, which is Automotive Skill Development Council. Welcome, Ramashankar. Last but not the least, uh, the gentleman is uh, known to everyone. We have Siddharth Vinayak Patankar. Uh, Siddharth is a senior editor, chief editor, auto. During his, uh, during his years with NDTV, he has conceived all automobile-based content and NDTV network, including the annual car and bike awards and the auto prime branding programming, which was launched in 2014. In his present role as editor-in-chief, he is one of the key drivers behind carandbike.com already the country's largest, second largest auto portal. Welcome Siddharth, and it's a pleasure to have you on the show. I agree, man. Very good. With this, we'll just uh, quickly, I'll just quickly set the context. Uh, I think uh, Sid, you rightly said that yes, uh, uh, you know, the sequence of events which all of us are going through um, are unprecedented. These are big challenging times. Uh, the overall global economy has been impacted. Uh, we all of us are also impacted personally, professionally in many ways. Auto sector somehow, which has been reeling under the pressure over the last many quarters, was somehow showing signs of recovery from Q4 of the previous year. But unfortunately, unfortunately, eventually, uh, the, you know, the lockdown and the, and the COVID environment has put the industry into a, into a very critical situation. There are multiple reasons uh, why we landed up in this uh, scenario. I think uh, the repercussions also are very significant. We saw major job losses also in the last year. Uh, there were many dealerships who went out of the business. Uh, the unemployment went up, the production stoppages happened at OEMs and the component manufacturers, so on and so forth. Now, just move on to the next slide, please. If we, took at, if we look at the recovery scenario, I think that's, uh, that's the biggest question which uh, Sid also talked about. Very difficult to predict, but if you look at the trend over the last 10 to 12 years, uh, somehow the auto industry in India has moved in tandem with the GDP growth that India has been having. Barring one or two years, uh, largely there has been some correlation between the growth in the sector and the GDP growth. And there are multiple or different estimates which have been given with respect to how the world economy is going to look like. Uh, there are contraction uh, which is expected to happen in most of the economies. India somehow uh, will remain positive. That's what the major estimates talk about. And if we were to do, or if we were to look at the historical trends and if the economy was to grow at say 1.9%, uh, our calculation, our estimates uh, show that yes, overall the volume decline uh, may, may, may lead to a further 15 to 20 odd percentage. What it means uh, in absolute terms, uh, you know, for example, in FI20, if the industry recorded a production of close to 26.3 million vehicles, uh, the volumes may, push us back to the levels of 2013 or 2014 maybe. Which also depends upon how soon is India able to come out of, of this particular phase. When we, talk to our client, when we talk to our colleagues in the UK and the US markets, it's normally the same or, or the similar trend which is appearing. I mean, they're also not expecting the recovery to happen anywhere between Q3 of the current financial year. Moving on the other challenge, this next slide, slide please. I think the other challenge which India really has is uh, with respect to its uh, sourcing. I mean, for example, 80% of the components uh, which India sources is all locally. Um, and if you were to map all the auto clusters uh, with the districts in which these uh, component suppliers are located, almost 60% of these uh, of these districts are still under the red zone as per the COVID norms. What it means that even if the OEMs were to restart or look at restarting the operations, there would be a huge supply chain risk impacting their operations. Why? Because the suppliers may not be able to immediately start their operations, which eventually will impact the overall production of, these, of those OEMs. As I say, nothing is more expensive than a missed opportunity. We at uh, Grand Thornton, we are very optimistic about, uh, about the industry and we see severe opportunities uh, across all the different domains within the industry. Let's move on to the next slide, please. 
if i'll just talk about four basic aspects i mean uh, said also also briefly touched upon it from a global supply chain perspective um, india currently imports almost 15% of it of its auto component requirements from different countries 30% comes from china balance 30% comes from european nations 40% comes from the other nations if we were to look at increasing the localization efforts and reduce and reduce our our reliance or our dependency on the imports i think that's one big opportunity which exists for the for the sector similarly if i unfortunately if we look at exports india is not amongst the top 8 or the top 10 export uh, oriented countries when it comes to auto components and we have been only exporting majorly to markets in us europe but not we have not expanded to the other countries i think that's where again there is a huge opportunity for india to really look at a preferred export hub in the in the times to come the other aspect is more in terms of how do we manage our cost of operations how do we bring more automation uh, when we talk to our clients in the it it es sector i think uh, most of them have been having a common voice that uh, these days the number of inquiries which are coming around for manufacturing automation has gone up significantly which means that the manufacturing companies are looking at adopting manufacturing 4.0 iot artificial intelligence machine learning aspects onto the shop floor there is a huge opportunity for india to relook at the skill development and wherever there is a skill deficit we need to be looking at alternative ways be it with respect to getting into technical collaboration with with outside companies or maybe getting into joint ventures with the companies outside this is more like mid to short term perspective for india the other important aspect is more from a consumer point of view and uh, you know this is really important because that's where oems and the the, the dealers will have to virtually remain connected with uh, with their customers in a, in a very sustained manner i think sid talked about um, hyundai giving giving hyundai as an example which is a classic example in terms of how oems and dealerships uh, have come together to remain connected with the customers the other thing maybe could be that how the business model the entire business model of running the dealerships could undergo a change maybe it calls for co investment between the oems and the dealerships uh, on demand forecasting tools on predictive analytics tool wherein instead of having more of a push strategy we convert ourselves into a pull strategy last but not the least is about the business continuity uh, you know the entire working environment has undergone a change in manufacturing or in auto working like uh, you know work from home has never been a concept per se but i think in these days uh, you know it has undergone a significant shift but yes what it has also brought uh, is are are a different risk dimensions to it be it on account of cyber security risk be it on account of uh, data privacy risk be it on account of software licensing risk so on and so forth so what it means is that all of us need to relook at our business models the way it can become more sustainable the way, the way it can become more more durable in the in the times to come so that's going to be the broad theme of our of our discussion with the panelist i'll just take a pause over here and i'll uh, request dr tim to come over and uh, share his experience of how china came out of uh, of of the covid environment wonderful thank you very much sakat for the introduction and the uh, the kind opportunity to share this time with the panelists um before i start into the china position i'd like to just give everyone joining today a quick overview of some statistics at the global level next slide please yes um first the analysis what we've got here in front of us are several graphs and charts that are uh that were prepared just a few days ago by the international monetary fund um the imf has um called the current situation we're in called it the great lockdown 2020 Um so the great lockdown if you look back and all of us were working just several years ago during the global financial crisis if you look back to benchmark it or to compare it to the situation that we experienced back in 2009 you'll see that it's much more severe in terms of scale and longevity um you'll also notice that uh this is greatly affecting and greatly impacting much of the developed world in terms of the econ economies and overall gdp However, I put on there it's not all doom and gloom because you can see the two countries that were identified uh being China and India have positive returns in the following year in 2021. So, if I can be of any bellwether or any uh positive signal to our friends in India as I sit here in China today, uh there is light at the end of the tunnel. We will get through this. Um and uh, we will look at a very prosperous and hopefully a very 
um, much better 2021. As the uh, IMF uh, statistics show on the far right side, we have a predictive 1.9% uh, growth in 2020 in India. However, it's going to bounce to uh, 74 which is very positive. Um, and then you're looking at China up in the 9% uh, GDP. So uh, just as a starting at the global level for encouragement, uh, I'd like to share that uh, statistics with everyone. Next slide, please. Great. So first of all, what I'd like to do is just share with you on the ground here in China what the situation looks like. And now everyone knows the COVID-19 outbreak has exposed rigorous challenges for the global automotive sector. Um, on March 27, 2020, Moody Investor Services once again reduced its global auto sales forecast um, to auto sales would plunge to about 14% in 2020. Um, pessimism really is spreading in the global auto industry. Um, however, according to statistics, what we saw uh, is that more than 150 auto factories in 26 countries around the world have been in the shutdown state. Now, due to the high degree of global and integration and the long industry chain that Sakat mentioned as well, um, there are many constraints for auto companies on the resumption of the manufacturing operations. However, while much of the world's output is grinding to a halt because of the COVID-19 crisis, uh, China is slowly emerging from its shutdowns and employees are returning to work production lines are starting to roll, and even in Wuhan, the original outbreak epicenter is ending its lockdown. Now, according to the industry data published by the China Association of Automobile Manufacturers, as of uh, April 22nd, just a few days ago, the resumption rate of China's automobile enterprises and parts enterprises has exceeded 90%. This is a sign of uh, optimism. And so, as the outbreak continues to wreak havoc in the global auto industry, China's recovery provides useful experiences for the resumptions for manufacturing operations. Let's look at some specific examples. Next slide, please. In the combat against COVID-19, there are discrepancies in the specific resumption measures adopted for individual companies, but overall, the auto companies in China have considered or taken actions or on, on some necessary issues to accelerate the resumption of manufacturing operations. Now, from an employee point of view, under the epidemic situation, the major difficulty for companies to restart production is how to manage and protect the employees, which is particularly challenging for the automotive manufacturing industry. The first idea of China's automotive enterprises is to strictly prevent the control the and, and control the uncertainty of the employees to the maximum extent. The second idea is to reduce the variables as much as possible by replacing some employees with what we would say risk-free robots. Now, one step that was taken certainly and one advice that I would share from the experiences here in China is to establish a team early to focus on the employees return deployment and the people management. Popularize prevention and treatment knowledge to its employees in time. So certainly spreading the word of what's taking place. And now here's some examples. Chang'an Automotive, one of China's four auto groups, has released reading requirements for all employees returning to work. Mandatory reading on this issue, educating the people. BYD, another automotive leader, has issued a detailed staff returning guide for the returned employees to provide specific guidance for all aspects. And GAC, another leading automotive manufacturer here, has specifically planned the column of epidemic prevention and control knowledge in the enterprise apps that they have in their, in their, in their phones. Employees need to carry out online learning, take training tests, so that they can master the necessary epidemic prevention knowledge in time. Now innovate, innovate the form and the way of work to reduce the risk of personal aggregation. So some examples here, remote working. Based on the principles of safety first, some automotive companies only maintain the non-production staff to the very minimum, the necessary personal return to the company while the others can work remotely. Changing modes of transportation. Employees are encouraged to drive, walk, or take company shuttles to work, to work in order to reduce the risk of cross-infection. Many production bases of Geely Automotive, for example, have arranged free chartered buses to welcome the return of the employees. Now, meanwhile, temperature monitoring, vehicle disinfection, ventilation, and other work is strictly observed throughout all of the companies. Decentralized dining. That principle is strictly followed by most auto companies today. To further ensure the safety of the employees, GAC Toyota, for example, has adopted a new dining form so that the employee is required to scan a barcode before and after the dining to record the dining time, the dining place, and other personal information. Next, 
let's pay attention to the employee's mental health as well. In view of the stress and the anxiety that, that are easy to occur uh, in this special period that we're all experiencing, employees' mental state is also very noteworthy. Chang'an Automotive has launched a 24-hour employee mental health consulting center to help employees in need of psychological counseling and crisis intervention to build a solid psychological defense for the employees. SAIC GM provides free professional mental health consulting services for employees of the Wuhan branch and their immediate relatives. Next slide, please. Now, in terms of the industry supply chain, there's also some actions that have been taken as well. The impact of the delayed resumption of production as brought by the outbreak on the upstream or downstream of the automotive sector is very obvious. The key point for China's automotive enterprises is to solve the problem, it's cooperation. That's the key point. First of all, cooperation with the local governments and the industrial parks. Seeking support from local governments and industrial parks is essential for the full recovery of the automotive enterprises. Tesla Superfactory in Shanghai encountered several problems when preparing for resumption, including the lack of infrared thermometers, temporary housing for employees, and office facilities. But this has all been settled by the industrial park. They intervened and they helped support the situation and they solved it. Second level of cooperation is with other production bases if possible. For auto enterprises with multiple production bases, they can properly coordinate production bases in different regions to complete uh, the cooperation efforts. For example, in Chang'an and Nanjing, the factory dispatched more than 300 workers in total to a Chongqing factory on February 27th and February 28th with the purpose to fully support the production of the Chang'an Chongqing factory. So shifting the employees or shifting the workers from one city to another to help make sure that there's business continuity. Third cooperation level is with component suppliers. Chang'an Automotive again, they set up a supply chain resources and coordination and a coordination team soon after the outbreak. The aim of this was to work with the suppliers to develop solutions to ensure the smooth redemption, resumption of the production bases of each of the companies. Wenzhou Chanjian, another company, an important component supplier of FAW Volkswagen, suffered a serious decline in production capacity due to the epidemic. Facing that situation, FAW VW quickly set up a leading working group and sent a support team of 156 technical staff to Wenzhou to help its suppliers meet the production targets. So it's not only support across the lines, but it's support with the suppliers throughout the entire chain. And then finally here is the support and the cooperation with the distributors. Facing this epidemic situation, many auto companies in China have formulated relevant aid policies for their distributors, the core of which is to reduce the pressure on them. Major methods adopted by China's automotive companies are poorly relaxing performance assessment requirements, not setting February sales targets, and providing subsidies for staffs of the distributors. Chang'an Automotive said that it also provides a series of help for distributors to sell cars online which has become an important means of marketing in the auto industry. Uh, Saket, this is all I have from the China side, uh, but certainly once we get to the end of this presentation, I'd be happy to answer any questions that the audience may have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Tim. Thanks a lot uh, for these very useful insights, uh, which uh, we firmly believe that uh, in India as well, we would be able to leverage upon these learnings, uh, what you talked about. Just uh, one question, if you could clarify in terms of uh, when you're looking at uh, the operations getting back to China in a normal manner, what uh, percentage of, uh, you know, the auto volumes are you looking at in the current year in China? Just a very high level perspective on that. I was at a 10. Um, it's a good question. And thank you. I attended an event yesterday where they said that actually some of the sales of the lower end cars have increased because the um, market here in China is unwilling to take the public transportation. So they're actually going out to buy cars to avoid getting into the, the buses and the subways and the railways. Um, so as a result, I think that's going to help mitigate some of the off sales from the early part of the year. But I heard around the 20% drop in the front part um, in general, but I think this could be a bit bigger of a number and it's still left to know. Um, so we're still waiting for the, the numbers to come in for second quarter. Sure. So I think we'll uh, move on to our uh, panelists now, uh, starting with you, Amit, uh, you know, if I can have you first, uh, because, uh, you know, when it comes to managing the operations in this kind of a given scenario, there are two aspects which become uh, absolutely relevant, which is cost and efficiency. 
and we have heard uh, dr tim also talked about how china is now looking at adopting different technologies my question to you would be that uh, how do you see office automation playing a significant role in kind of balancing between cost and efficiency uh, in your kind of a business wherein you have operations not only in india but even outside india yeah thanks uh, saket for uh, giving this opportunity to be part of this uh, panel and uh, i think let me first start with a disclaimer that uh, in this uh, unprecedented time or the event i think maybe probably after world war 2 this is what is happening so uh, i guess no one is expert on what to do but i think uh, we all are trying to put our brain to see that what collectively we can find solutions so i guess people who are having a bcp probably they will be better prepared but Uh, this is definitely unprecedented so coming to your point on uh, how do we tackle uh, the cost and efficiency expectation in this time uh, let me just uh, um, just try in uh, paint a picture of where we are and how probably we should take this forward so i would uh, say that uh, we should take a approach of preserving present and then securing future so i think first thing is to make sure that uh, we 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 get on with the uh, production and for that i think uh, the first priority for all of us i think is to have our employees safe our uh, our organizations safe our plants safe because without that uh, nothing will work out and in this uh, uh, kind of environment where we are uh, every action will be very very closely watched by government and we'll have to make sure that uh, uh we we give due importance to maintaining all the guidelines which have come uh we have uh, been working on it as an organization and a lot of insights inputs have been coming from our customers our uh, peers and i think uh, this is uh, a a true environment of collaboration which is coming out very clearly uh i think what we'll have to also do is while we are gearing up uh, for uh, production we'll have to paint various scenarios like 25% volume of 50 and 75 we'll have to look at manpower uh, to be planned and other resources because uh, with the social distancing norm to be followed many of us will have to revisit our assembly lines our uh, process uh, setups because probably they are not uh, designed for such kind of social distancing so this is at least in our business is uh, coming as a uh, interesting challenge to work on and i assume this will also give uh, opportunity for uh, th- seeing things in a very different way what we are also seeing is uh, a need for strong digital connect uh, i'm sure you would have seen that joke which was going around that who got digitization so is it your ceo cio or covid 19 so i think we all know the answer and uh, manufacturing industry uh, especially automobile or auto, uh, auto component i think this has been a steep jump for all of us and i am happy that we are able to live up to those expectation and uh, today all our uh, staff uh, all our people are well connected and we are able to work from home another paradigm shift for auto component we all feel that uh, we can't do anything if we are not going to office so that is also changing uh what we have also realized is that uh, this is also a time for very strong communication communication at all level communication to all stakeholders and i think uh, we need to drive it from top we need to make sure that uh, uh, all stakeholders get the due reassurance because i think uh, all of us are trying to overcome this and this is the time which we need to make sure our supply chain is well secured and we also need to make sure that we give them all guidance and i think especially for auto component supply chain or suppliers i think we need to do lot more because uh, there is a steep gap in many cases now i think what we are going to do from 3 to 9 month whatever i said was probably something which we'll have to do 3 month horizon i think 3 to 9 month is probably where we'll have to focus more on the cost and efficiency we will have to recover our uh, productivity loss which we are going to see 
uh, in this period of next three months where we are ramping up, we are trying to manage the social distance. We have extra people on floor because of various audit requirements, various checks and balances. So we'll have to find new ways of scaling uh, or kind of going back to the productivity level where we were pre-COVID. And again, we'll have to look at uh, also strengthening our basics. I think uh, uh, I, I heard from someone saying that uh, true uh, need for uh, the Swachh Bharat is coming now. So I think this is going to be a, a time of real behavior change and we'll have to drive that. So I think uh, uh, cost will be definitely focused. We are looking at various actions. And one thing which we have decided is that uh, no cost is fixed cost. So very clear, uh, look at all your cost, including office, staff, uh, various kind of uh, even uh, things like audits, uh, we'll have to look at them completely from zero base because uh, the times have changed. And we are looking at, uh, looking at how do we uh, uh, make our break even as low as possible because then only we can survive with the required cash flow. Uh, what is really coming out as a big opportunity is localization. I think uh, this is a time which I foresee a uh, government to be very, very, uh, not only sorry, government, the OEMs to be much more uh, willing to look at uh, localization on a quick turnaround. And I think this is where we need to collaborate across the supply chain to make this happen. And then eventually utilize this whole uh, thing to also look at the exports to see that wherever we can uh, have the volume growth because uh, along with the cost down, I think we'll have to look at seriously where we can grow the revenue because there are limitations for cost to be down to the extent possible. Uh, I, uh, I mean, as an organization, we foresee that uh, we probably will have to reorganize ourselves for the new normal, uh, the current structure, the current way of working, uh, the automation, as you mentioned, the office automation will definitely come into picture. Use of cobots should come into picture. The, there will be opportunities even for outsourcing of services, going into shared services. Many things which we have been talking, but I think the time has come for taking the decision and take action. So uh, I think this is a topic which we can keep going on, but these are some uh, few thoughts which I just wanted to share with all of you. And thanks again for this opportunity. Thank you, Amit. I think very uh, relevant point when we look at uh, more from a cost or an efficiency standpoint, because uh, as we all know, cost cannot be looked at only from a one single aspect. It has to be looked at from an entire organization standpoint, uh, be it supply chain, be it uh, you know, the way we are communicating back with our customers and the other stakeholders, the way we, we change our manufacturing practices, the way we start automating our practices, and this in the long run will certainly drive benefits, not only for an organization, but even for the customers. Uh, moving on to a similar aspect, uh, let me bring Rama over here. Rama, uh, you've been managing the affairs of a large auto component in India, manufacturing company in India, and uh, your organization has presence in almost um, 125 uh, nations. I mean, uh, you know, what's, what's your perspective when it comes to adoption of technology, particularly on the supply chain side? I'll tell you where I'm coming from. Uh, when we speak to our customers, when we speak to our global customers, there is a lot which is happening globally with respect to OEMs and the suppliers coming together, creating some kind of a distributed peer-to-peer -peer network, maybe by use of blockchain as a technology. So what's your sense about um, India really being prepared to adopt those technologies? Since you also sit as an executive uh, council member on ASTC, I mean, what are your views on the skill being available to use such technologies in India. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, so thanks a lot, Saket, and welcome everybody. Uh, you know, to me, I just continue where Amit uh, just left. If you look at the overall automotive industry, we are one of the celebrated industry, and uh, uh, we have two major phases. One phase is still we have the lockdown and the, you know, the whole social distancing and, uh, you know, fudgy situation, which is very uncertain and full of fear. Now, this situation looks to be temporary, but it's a long temporary. 
and what changes you will see and the example you you showed regarding uh, the development of industry 4.0 development of blockchain development of using ai ml development of connected uh, supply chain completely connected supply chain where things are you know in an ideal world if all of this we automate and we depend a lot only just like we are doing work out of home can you consider something like this for a manufacturing ecosystem now for the world even without covid or with covid they were moving in that direction but for india we have to look at differently the indian uh, automotive industry is a flagship for providing you know employment providing uh, the micro entrepreneurship we call tier 2 tier 3 suppliers so we are very different so when we are very different we have to look into this issue let's take we again divide into two one this uh, during the covid era and then post covid era whether covid or without covid uh, the the indian automotive industry also was moving quite a lot in in the collaboration phase even at acma the whole edi and you know in a small steps we were taking but we were we taking a large step or a far i think we were not and uh, maybe covid can push it uh, the, the way the digitization has happened in terms of if tcs is telling 75% of employee can work out of home uh, why it was only now or why it is only now because it's a mindset change which is happening i think there will be a big mindset change now because it is the time where the dependence interdependence on the supplier not only on tier 1 but tier 1 tier 2 tier 3 and the oem is pretty high a uh, uh, oem cannot start its factory today if the dealerships are not running at the same time if uh, one of my sub supplier in in a red zone is not able to supply me so there is huge dependence on each other which will push us now to do the common not only common funding but also common blueprinting of things so which also means that our fragmented industry association you know you have acma you have you know siam you have the electric vehicle association coming up you have uh, the tire battery association you have tractor as separate you have mining construction separate i guess somewhere a huge collaboration will start coming in in this time uh, to let things run because at this time it is like a bottleneck management so whatever will come as a bottleneck we will sort it out now post covid i see a major turn around post covid the whole mindset what we will receive now i think we should not lose this opportunity and nobody will lose this opportunity we have to find out who is going to invest into these technologies and if you look at two angle first is the tier 2 tier 3 they are really small one in fact many of them because of their fear psychosis they may not even be there you know and, and this is one uh, problem where not only auto industry but all manufacturing industry has been disrupted Uh, the good thing with the digital ecosystem is a mobile manufacturing or a or a laptop manufacturing they have got a standard you know modernization or you can call a, a mass customization they they have this mass customization idea already in grain automotive still does not have i think the auto oems will still differentiate based on the customer choices but somewhere we have to come to a place where suppliers should be allowed not only build to print you know one supplier should not only depend on one oem but like a collective cluster where one person is becoming expert and the technology goes to a higher level he is able to design develop and then give it to many oem so that in, in minimize the investment and that is where industry 4.0 and all the technology adoption will be faster otherwise tier 1 will be a sandwich my fear is that the tier 1 will be a sandwich where tier 2 and tier 3 because your uncertainty will remain the same even if i if i uh, integrate my whole supply chain my weakest link will be tier 2 and tier 3 which will not invest in the same way and the dependence will be a problem same way the second issue is the is the blue collar because we are still highly dependent on the weak link still remain our uh, blue collars which is not skill which is not as much trained and there is no mechanism today of a collective mechanism by which we are training them be it drivers for trucks uh, nobody is taking the responsibility that all the drivers are well equipped like a professional commercial pilot system they don't even have a association like that similarly you see the blue collar in our industry it is the effort of individual uh, one of us who are training them getting them of course asdc is doing its job but it is far 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 lagging so uh, i think what my um, uh, i am not going to uncertainty of demand and other thing but something is very certain that we can use this crisis 
for bringing a collective ecosystem for the skilling part where we have the migration of uh, you know um, the compatibility of labor to move from one uh, supplier to another supplier or from oem to supplier you know this kind of stuff is needed from asdc perspective and also from the ecosystem perspective so i guess my doubt still remain that how much covid will force us to collaborate that way uh, but i also am very optimistic that this will bring a huge collaboration and a major change will happen in terms of modular customization suppliers will be able to become exports and they will have their own brand of course there are two area again b2b and b2c b2b will still be faster but b2c where the consumer demand will you know will change so fast nobody will be able to forecast and supply chain has to be extremely agile so the technology will definitely come in in a fast pace but who will pay for the technology because our cost of capital is so high in our country um, this will be a question mark where we need the role clarity and this will develop over time maybe it will develop now during the covid period that who will take what load to bring those kind of automation because today if you take one project of a oem and the kind of investment you say you need a volume to sustain and this volume has to be for some years two years three years four years now in the post covid era when uncertainty is so high nobody is going to guarantee the volume and then when nobody is going to guarantee the volume what kind of agreement we will have with the between oems and suppliers how fuzzy this you know how forgiving this agreement will be and still protecting the investment of each other and the sustainability element i think this is a strange situation but we will uh, come through if the fast collaboration will be pushed by covid I think very rightly said, Amit um, <clears throat> Rama Shankar, and I completely agree with you that these are not the usual times for everyone, uh, and it calls for uh, you know completely different mindset, completely different line of thinking. Uh, calls for a lot of uh, co-investment, I would say, by the suppliers, by the OEMs, by the dealerships, and that's where um, you know I think uh, adoption of technology becomes imperative, uh, not only in one part of the entire value chain but across uh, the value chain. um and i think that's what got echoed by dr tim also you know when he talked about the china story uh, vivek uh, let me get you in over here and uh, you know i'm going to ask you about a slightly a different or a more strategic uh, aspect uh, you know when we look at india as a manufacturing destination and we heard uh, uh, rama shankar talking about skills uh, amit also talked about uh, technology so there are enablers be it with respect to technology be it with respect to skills what is that what is that uh, which will make india a very conducive uh, platform for the global investors or the oems to come and start establishing their shops in india or manufacturing hubs in india is the government support re really there we uh, we recently saw that the government had laid out uh, had laid down something like a production linked incentives for the uh, electronics industry are there such kind of incentives which are available for the auto industry and if not then what is that which needs to be thought by the government to make it as a preferred uh, manufacturing destination thanks aket that's a fairly big question to answer in 4 minutes but i'll give it a go so first uh, the overall question will auto supply chain be recast the answer is fairly short and crisp yes it will and certainly so and second and this is probably the crux of what you were asking will the indian auto component sector benefit from this inevitable shift now this answer is also yes but there are a few caveats here uh, and these are not because of the engineering or manufacturing capabilities of our indian auto sector but because of two factors uh, one is macro and one is slightly micro so the first one i mean as we all know india has never missed an opportunity to miss an opportunity right since the liberalization days of early 90s and narsimha rao ji the opportunity to become the factory of the world has always been there for india and time after time we keep missing those opportunities be it because of land or labor reforms uh, atavistic almost taxation norms general bureaucratic inefficiencies we haven't been able to capture that potential so if you look at the automotive supply chain the trend of shifting away from china started around 2015 16 because of purely economic reasons the labor costs in china as they started rising people started looking for alternatives the us china trade war after trump got elected that added more urgency to the shifting 
and this COVID-19 crisis has now further accelerated uh, this move. However, the spoils haven't really come to India. They've gone to countries like Mexico, Vietnam, and Thailand. And we have benefited for sure. We've seen our exports grow as an industry over the last five years, but not as much as we could have. Yeah. And last year though, we saw some real, real intent, right? I mean, the Indian government's lowered the corporate tax rates, uh, setting up of manufacturing units is possibly more attractive than ever before. New manufacturing units. I mean, the tax rates for them are 17%. That's the lowest in the region in probably the developing world. If the government can add to this with some more business friendly uh, policies on energy security or energy supply, labor reforms, infrastructure adequacy, and increase cooperation with industry in general, there is no reason that this cannot happen, especially with four countries I'll talk about, US, Korea, France, and Japan. Uh, we as a company, and obviously slightly uh, more uh, micro view, have been seeing some shifting inquiries in the last month from the US and Korea already. And this will undoubtedly grow for all of us. So there is a significant opportunity here. Now the second point, this is where the auto industry and our capability comes in. Now you all know the new part development or even shifting of existing production parts is one time consuming and also expensive. There has to be enough economic gain in the proposition to warrant incurring design, tooling expenses all over again. Now understand this has already been done with one supplier. We are doing all over again to shift the same parts. And with most of our customers struggling for cash right now, I mean, there has to be good reason to prioritize spending more money to shift production parts. However, this does not stop the shift. It will delay it. So I would say the results would come in between 15 to 24 months, but you will start seeing this shift, especially, like I said, from the four countries I mentioned. Uh, we as an industry, I mean, we can't just put it all on the government, you guys as uh, advisors to global businesses, we as uh, the industry and ACMA, we have to play a role in ensuring tech transfer and JVs are not just restricted to the tier ones like Sona, Minda, Madison, etc. We need to support our tier two and tier three, use our network to make those introductions so that they can also start getting into those partnerships. So that's something we need to do. So to sum up my long-winded answer, yes, there will be a shift. Yes, Indian auto component industry has the capability and the capital. I mean, people think we are not so well off, but if you look at the balance sheets of Indian auto component companies as compared to the financial crisis, much, much stronger. So we also have the cap capital to gain from this, but the gains will be slightly lesser than what we think, and it will take slightly longer than we think to realize. However, I think on this question, at least, we can all be optimistic. Thanks, Akin. I completely agree uh, with you, Vivek. I think it's a very pertinent point which you talked about uh, joint ventures and technical collaborations. And that's where, uh, you know, tier two, uh, sorry, the tier one manufacturers need to handhold tier two and tier three. And I'm coming from an experience that uh, when, uh, you know, two or three years back, when there was much, uh, much talked about uh, electric vehicle transition, uh, the worst impacted were the tier three manufacturers because they were not clear about in which direction to go. And, uh, you know, to an extent it reached to a stage that there were certain manufacturers who were also looking at uh, closing their businesses and doing something else in life. So I think this kind of a collaboration, particularly in these times, which are not the usual times would really help the overall industry to go to go further from where we are currently. Uh, Mr. Tanija, uh, you know, you have been on the finance side uh, throughout your career. You have looked at things uh, very, very closely when it comes to finance, the core finance and liquidity has been the much has been the much most talked about, I would say, aspect uh, during these times. What we've also seen, the government has also rolled out many, uh, many, many, many uh, reforms of late, be it uh, monetary policy, be it on the fiscal reforms, uh, be it in terms of easing out the liquidity and making the money goes out to the end customer. What's, what's your view in terms of all these measures, how effective the auto companies have been able to reap benefits of these measures? And have they, have they, have they learned something out of this episode in terms of uh, liquidity, in terms of retention strategies? 
Uh, thank you, Saket, and thank you, everybody. We are back to our old mantra, cash is king. And this COVID crisis is a typical example of VUCA environment. And one thing is very, very clear that we'll have to live with Corona and move forward. We will have to find ways and means to get back on rails and live with Corona. Liquidity is not just limited to the OEM or the supplier. It is a complete value chain, OEM, supplier, tier one, tier twos, dealer, and also the aftermarket and the end consumer. The whole cycle is liquidity, basically. What we have noticed is companies which are highly leveraged are at a disadvantage. Companies who have a war chest, healthy balance sheet are in a relatively better position. We have even noticed that companies which have healthy balance sheet and cash flows and cash availability are still mopping up resources mainly through NCDs. And that is mainly to prepare them for the unknown in case it may come through. So they are having a strong war room, cash room available with them. Also the companies which have been in the past focusing only on the top line and bottom line and ignoring their cash flow and the balance sheet are also at a disadvantage. Long time mantra has been have free cash, but not having known the unknown, some companies mortgage there today for a future tomorrow and this irony and the COVID strikes them. This crisis is not specific to any country or specific sector. This is a crisis which has impacted each and every auto and auto supplier in the world. And global companies which are operating in India also are, have a major risk of a limited support financially from their parent. So what are the lessons learned? The first and the foremost is ensuring solvency and scenario planning. And the companies need to plan their cash flows as per V, U or L curve roll out their daily, weekly, monthly plan, and like in the armed forces, have a commander in chief. As head of cash war room or chest, prepare a risk chart and risk mitigation chart. In this case of the liquidity, the paramount importance will be decisive and clear leadership and speed and discipline will distinguish between proactive and the dormants. I will now call cash outflow as cash burning. Any cash burning, let there be a bureaucracy in an organization in auto auto component sector. Multiple layers of decision making before even a single penny is burnt. Centralize all cash operation with the commander in chief and he should give the final approval for any finance uh, cash outflow have daily monitoring of the actual versus variance. Fix the KPIs and key areas of the team to focus on liquidity, cash inflow, and reduction or deferment of cash outflows. Today we have liquidity mainly required for the fixed costs, salary, wages, suppliers, statutory payment, taxes, insurance, vital in investments to maintain uh, business operation we need to go back to Blackboard, redefine our cost structure, have a zero-based structure and zero-based organization model, past is history, start afresh, what was relevant yesterday is not relevant for tomorrow due to the cash crunch we have, redo your break-even point. What are the do's, how do we move forward? I'm sure all the companies, auto car makers are having an open communication with all the stakeholders. For this, the auto and the automakers and the tiers need to have a motivated, dedicated leadership team in place to take forward this journey of cash, liquidity, availability to survive and grow. We have seen in the terms of employees, workers, many companies taking many measures giving 
if salary cuts 10 to 40 percent, some for quarter one, quarter two, some are giving furloughs, work from home. We should be ready, though we have to have a human angle in place in case the question comes of survival. We will have to have a lean organization, cut out the fat and lay off the excess manpower. This is very, very important, but tough. We need to monetize all our non-core assets, surplus assets. Review all your existing projects and outflows. Minimize discretionary spending. Working capital. Liquidate excess inventory, right of dead inventory. No inventory buffers. Strict inventory norms and inventory turnover ratio as per best industry benchmarks. Any pipeline inventory is to be reviewed. Settle all disputes with your debtors. Collect the money as early as possible. Even if you have to offer cash discount to have cash inflow from debtors, bill discounting. Even companies and automakers and part makers may look at consolidating their operations and plants where you have the same product produced across multiple locations. Also, review all your current assets, be it cash advances, margins, deposits, and renegotiate in them. Work from home, let be the new normal, and companies can even have different terms of uh, salary package for people working from home in order to cut, uh, cut down the cost till the time things come back to normal. We need to renegotiate our long-term debts and debt restructuring. Renegotiating even your monthly rentals and leasing and other options. See, the whole value chain of liquidity is linked to the OEM. OEM being in the front has to bear the pressure and have their own set of challenges. Some tier ones are relatively better than the other tier two and tier threes. Dealers are the worst off. Everybody is looking to the OEM and tier two, tier three, and tier four are looking to their tier ones. Also important factor is that we have noticed that once the lockdown opens, people will probably go to the second hand pre-owned vehicles for two wheelers or four wheelers. So the aftermarket, the dealers being worst off, the OEM and the companies which have a strong aftermarket network will have to motivate their dealer network and come out with schemes and financing and packages so that there is an uptick in the volume till the time the OEM volumes come back to the normal. We also seen that the companies which are proactive versus dormant, they have a sustained their organic growth very early throughout the recession and re re recoveries, not only in terms of the revenues, but also in terms of their EBITDA and other margins. They move faster and harder on productivity and preserve growth capacity. Uh, Mr. Tanija, if, uh, Mr. Tanija, thank you very much. In the interest of time, I'll just uh, move on to uh, Siddharth. Just uh, one uh, last uh, recommendation, uh, Saket. I will just only uh, take a second. Yeah. Uh, during this period of lockdown, our major expense is going to be on salary, wages, and uh, right. major discount. And since all the most of the companies are public listed, I have a recommendation that let this amount of the expense, which is salary major than the statutory cost, which is charged off to p and be treated as a deferred revenue expenditure to be charged off over two to three years so that it does not distort the ratios of the public listed companies for the accountability and shareholders. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tanija. Uh, so that uh, moving on to you on a different dimension altogether, you know, what we really heard uh, from the other co-panelists uh, was more in terms of uh, the strategic uh, aspects, more in terms of uh, the operational aspects around technology, so on and so forth. Moving on to the market scenario, you know, how do you see the customers are going to react uh, post COVID? I mean, you know, which was so much uh, talked about in a pre COVID environment. Uh, you know, you've been tracking the industry so closely. I mean, what are your thoughts? What are your views on this? 
Uh, hi, good evening, Saket. Good evening, everyone. And uh, I'm assuming this is uh, to this Siddharth and not the other one. So I'll uh, quickly jump into it. Uh, you know, there are, there are many things that we can sort of uh, talk about, and I'll quickly temper it with the fact that some of this, let's, let's accept, uh, is purely speculation because, you know, we still don't yeah. know exactly how people are going to end up reacting. This is going to be so behaviorally led uh, rather than, you know, uh, focused on any kind of uh, actual metric. Now, having said that, uh, there are many indications that are coming in. We certainly interact with a lot of people on a daily basis, uh, sometimes hourly. And uh, I can tell you that, you know, there is a great sense of uh, the unknown that seems to sort of override most of their thoughts. And yes, I think uh, logic also states that there are certain things that you can expect will happen. The move towards more personal uh, modes of mobility, uh, you know, moving away from shared mobility, perhaps even not uh, getting into state or, or, or uh, central uh, government-related transport solutions, uh, which means that, you know, there's going to be a big shift in terms of that pattern of how people commute. Um, now, add to that the layer that many, many corporates are looking at extending work from home for a very long period of time. Uh, that also means that uh, the need for mobility will kind of go down as an average. So with you, if you put all of that together, I'll go back to what Dr. Klatt was saying earlier about China, what's already happening there. Uh, you know, smaller segment vehicles picking up in popularity. We're likely to see that happen here, especially in the passenger vehicle space. Uh, we'll also see possibly a little bit of a shift back to two wheelers, especially scooters as a segment uh, could see a bit of an uptake. And then let's not forget the used car space. That's another one that will likely benefit, uh, you know, it, especially the organized sector there uh, would, uh, in, in my view, do well to sort of almost uh, capitalize on this opportunity. Um, and in whichever scenario you look at, whether it's an OEM, whether it's, uh, you know, a, a used car entity, uh, they will have to address certain concerns of this consumer. The biggest one will be sanitization of the vehicles. There'll have to be some sort of a very formal sort of a plan that will have to be put into place, which is very visible, very acceptable by the public as well. And, uh, you know, the consumer will certainly define some of those parameters and boundaries. Um, one other thing which I feel that, you know, we should quickly look at before I talk about electrics is that, uh, you know, when it comes to the sense of uh, mobility, uh, let's not forget that, you know, it's very easy to sit here and opine on what we think might happen. But some of it is purely led by, you know, the, the financials, the economics of it. And so, uh, you know, when you, we can't just quickly dismiss uh, away the fact that some of these uh, shared mobility solutions will suffer very greatly. Yes, they will suffer. But I'm sure that some of them will also come up with innovative solutions. Uh, and we're already hearing about quick turnarounds on sanitizing vehicles, uh, you know, driver health checks and reports being provided on the app to the uh, uh, user, et cetera. So some amount of that will still continue to happen. And I do believe there'll be a huge shift in terms of, uh, or, or rather a huge difference, uh, pardon me, in terms of how this consumer may behave in uh, a tier uh, one city versus let's say a tier three setup. Um, speaking to what you uh, asked about the uh, electric vehicle scenario, you know, We've heard so much lip service over the years about the electric vehicle space. Uh, there's been a lot of good intent. There's been a lot of uh, sort of, uh, you know, hypotheses, but the consumer eventually cares uh, not so much about having a green conscience, but let's face it, you know, con consumer really wants this to sort of work for them. It has to make sense for them. And until you have the infrastructure, until you have, uh, you know, good value proposition on these vehicles, that's not gonna happen. But maybe the current situation being the way it is, where yes, sustainability, you know, having that sort of focus on, on, on the planet, et cetera. These kind of thoughts have come up. They will guide some amount of that consumer behavior, we believe. And so uh, there could be, therefore, a bigger sort of a push or a demand from the consumer side uh, for accelerating some of these programs. And while the full EV is still going to be far away, in my view, because, you know, a lot of other things need to fall into place, not just people asking for it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we just still don't have any incentives, for example. But you know, in the interim, if we can at least shift to seeing some sort of incentivizing for hybrids, I believe that again could be a great opportunity. It's good for the OEMs. It's probably going to be good for, from a messaging point of view for the government as well. And then, you know, you dovetail all of this into how do you spur this demand, whether it is hybrid, whether it is electric, whether it is ice. Well, again, back to incentives. Now, we keep talking about uh, all sorts of packages that should be offered by the government. Uh, you know, every sector wants one, no doubt about it. Every sector will probably need one too. But in the automotive context, you know, the one thing that's been a constant demand, and I don't hear, I'm not talking about just the GST rate cut, which becomes this annual pre-budget exercise. It's not that. It's about incentivizing for uh, actually recycling and therefore scrappage of vehicles. 
uh, you know, there's been such a lot of talk about having a scrappage policy. But what is that scrappage policy? It's still not fully defined. We are now told that it's more or less ready. The draft has been sitting there, you know, with the government for some time. If that gets green lighted, and it's also defined well in terms of its boundaries, in terms of what qualifies as a vehicle that's ready for scrappage, how much of an incentive do I as a consumer or, uh, you know, any of the people between me and the OEM stand to benefit from on the scrappage policy? I think if that is pushed through, then honestly, it could be win-win because uh, it's good for the environment, it's good for the government, it's good for the exchequer in terms of the GST earnings, and of course, it's good for the OEMs and the consumers. So, uh, you know, we need to have that kind of big picture, comprehensive thinking. Um, the pessimist in me, which usually doesn't have a voice, uh, says that that might not happen. But uh, the optimist says that the need of the R is that something radical does need to happen. I think everybody recognizes that. And I think the consumer will stay at the center of it, thankfully, unlike what we've seen the last few years when the industry has had all sorts of issues. But, you know, everybody's kind of forgotten about how the consumer needs to benefit at the end of the day. Here, I feel the consumer will drive that change, or at least that's my hope. Sati. Absolutely, Siddharth, so very uh, well uh, articulated, I would say. And, uh, you know, I was talking to my colleagues in UK yesterday. I think it's a similar voice which was coming from UK as well, uh, that, uh, you know, mobility as a service uh, will, will play a very significant role in the, in the years to come. And that's where the customers will have multiple options available with them with respect to availing different modes of transportation, not only a single shared mobility as, as an option. And the other point which you talked about in terms of the scrappage policy, I think it goes back to the fact uh, that, yes, uh, there is a lot of uh, to be done by the government on the policy reforms. That's the point which we were discussing with Vivek as well. Now, uh, let me bring in uh, Julian over here. Uh, you know, Julian, we have heard uh, multiple aspects, uh, you know, of, of an organization, right from strategy operations, uh, consumer focus, um, manufacturing, so on and so forth. You look at organization, uh, you know, completely in a different manner because as a, as a head of compliance, as a head of controls, uh, you, you, you come across different, uh, different scenarios, different risk. And post-COVID, I'm sure your risk registers would have completely undergone a shift, would have had uh, multiple new risks coming in. How do you, how, what's your experience of coming out of this scenario, having a full-fledged PCP plan in, in place? Yeah, um, from a controls perspective, things are drastically changing it. And we're actually seeing it across multiple organizations in the way that the external auditors, God forbid I say that word in this sort of forum, actually look at organizations and look at companies. And they're actually introducing a lot of new risks into the debate. So one of the things that we're actually finding, management have historically from their enterprise risk management, it's been very tactical. It's um, been very much about the shop floor. It's about getting new products to market. It's where's the next big thing. And it's not about the nuts and bolts that make the organization work. And one of the things that's really coming to the forefront now are those hidden risks within the business. So um, cybersecurity isn't a um, sexy subject for engineers that want to look at new products. Um, I've seen some smiles around the faces here, um, but in times of crisis like this, where we've got everybody working from home, we've got um, certain individuals working from non-company issued assets, we've had to reduce um, security barriers to allow people to get to systems to approve the invoice so we don't impact that next supplier so they can continue manufacturing. All of these things, we're having to take a step back now and we're actually having to look at what are those hidden risks within our business? What have we always said that's a nice thing to do when it's now becoming the fundamental thing to do to protect your data assets, to protect your people? Um, also, there's other risks that come to the forefront. So, obviously, I'm working in a global business. We've got some major subsidiaries overseas. Um, in certain parts of the world, there's all sorts of legislation about health and safety. Um, but there are other societies out there where you're now asking people to work from home, but do they actually have a table to work at? Do they have suitable seating? Are they going to start getting back problems? Are they going to start making medical claims against the business, which are all, again, hidden risks 
not been considered before. How many of you are sitting there day on day on your sofa, in your bedroom, kitchen, stood on the work surface? Are we being ergonomic with our people? This is a hidden risk. It's a huge cost to the business, should it evolve, and how you're keeping those people. And other things that are coming out are things like treasury risks. You know, we, we are now going from, we were all very good at our treasury hedging controls, making sure that our long-term debt, and it's been alluded to already about cash is now king. We have an awful lot of funding and um, debt out there through that treasury hedging methodologies that we apply. Are they COVID proof? Not quite sure. And now we've got corporate treasurers around the world in every single jurisdiction because we've got countries taking out multi-billion trillion loans to keep their population going, keeping money going into the economy. And every single business, OEMs and elsewhere, are going to suffer from the cost of debt. Hidden risk. So I think a lot of boards are now actually going back to the fundamentals. They only ever really reported their top 10 risks, top 20 risks in their annual filings. They're actually now going to be looking at that a lot closer because as stakeholders, shareholders, um, city analysts that are looking at financial statements going forward, are going to be looking at it from a completely different lens. So it's not just about the going concern of the business and the asset to debt ratio and return on investment. It's also about the hidden risks within the business. So I think we've got a long way to go. I think um, this space is really gonna open up and become a lot more important to the SCOM in the way that they actually look at the business because historically controls has all been are we approving the invoices do we have the right it infrastructure mm -hmm. in place whereas now controls is actually saying are they managing our risk i can see you laughing there vivek so i'm obviously hitting a spot um i i i can just see it shifting potentially to actually saying controls are now about risk management they're not about ticking a box very right uh, julian i think many thanks for that uh, very useful insights and as you talked about the hidden risk i think that's something which impacts all organizations uh, and it, it impacts all individuals rather i would say um, i guess one of the common themes which has really emerged uh, from the from the discussion that we had so far is about innovation and collaboration uh, let me bring in Vivek uh, back onto the discussion. Vivek, I mean, you know, you've been an investment banker also, you know, uh, and you look at uh, the investment scenario very closely. Um, globally, if you look at uh, when we talk to our clients, uh, there is a lot of uh, M&A activities in the auto space, which is happening around auto tech. Uh, you know, we are talking about enterprise applications. We talk about uh, connected cars. We talk about solution providers around shared mobility. If you, were, if you were to talk about the India scenario, you know, more from an M&A perspective or more from a privately or a venture capitalist perspective, do you think the investment uh, or, or the investors would be looking at India differently from what they look at globally? Or India is a different story by way of consolidation by elimination? Thanks, Akit. Uh, first to Julian. Julian, this is risk management's finest hour. So you guys, this is your spotlight hour. I love it. I'm in my element now. It's yeah. like all of these years I've been saying, please consider risk. It's not just a yeah. tick box exercise. And now, audit committee's best friend. Truly, audit committee was the longest committee meeting we ever had this time around. So it's never happened Excellent. before. So good. <laughs> okay, Saket, for m and uh, and for the record, I'm never an investment banker. Not that good. Uh, I helped investment bankers. Okay, we uh, as a company, of course, have done some acquisitions recently. And we will continue on the same template. However, as an industry, what I, like, I would like to see happening is 
good m and a not m and a for revenue increasing which is something that auto component industry should move away from entirely yeah. you know this fixed station with what is your turnover that mm. question that everyone asks in acma it's a idiotic question who cares what is your ebitda nobody asks do you have to be so many billion became that thing and i hope people do not do acquisitions to increase turnover anymore that will not fly in this environment julian said it enough there are too many unknowns there are too many risks out there let's take on what we can manage uh i think the old things will still hold there are three kinds of assets there are good assets with good financing nothing will happen to them they will continue i mean most of good assets with good financing due to 10 months of liquidity they can sit this lockdown out for a long time then you have bad assets with good financing now they will struggle and will they get a good home no it's a brutal truth but they will die in this then there are bad assets with bad financing they should have been dead already i mean that's just inevitable then you have good assets with bad financing you know good companies which are good they they will just see a change of ownership assets will survive if there's a good asset it produces a part or an assembly that is required by the industry yes it will be sad for the current shareholders but you know what the industry will go on it will just find a new home somebody else will take it over and that's what you'll see happening not consolidation by elimination and all those buzzwords there are just four kinds of assets and financing someone in 2017 took out a huge debt and today can't repay yes that asset won't go down the customers won't let it and there is if it's economic opportunity people will take care of it will we see cross border i doubt it i think everyone's equally hit there isn't that much cash and the deglobalization trend means we need to look at our own uh, family to take care of it maybe and somebody has asked that question in the chat i was reading that will oems take over some of the suppliers well the japanese ones might it is part of how they have done business a they may take over more ownership this has happened before the korean companies again may do the same so you will see it but it's not really a cross border I mean, it's just getting shareholding into a preferred supplier i do not see european companies or american companies coming and using this as an opportunity to increase they have their own problems chinese oems and auto component will want to but i think the government may not like that to happen i think indian companies and acma senior acma members uh, and sona being one of them we will certainly look at all opportunities that are there we will prefer people uh, who are more or at least adjacent to what we do the drive line and the electric drive line uh, but yeah we will be looking at opportunities i think you will see some amenity but again, not as much as you thought people are not that weak like i said at least if you look at all the listed guys look at their balance sheets there is enough balance sheet strength you should look at a metric called employee costs by ebitda this is not what we look at usually but look at it mm -hmm. anyone above 100% they are they are looking at a little bit of trouble i think mr tanija said that fixed cost and amit also said fixed cost has to become variable start looking at this metric for anyone analyzing this sector and you will realize there are companies out there at 150 200% of ebitda's employee cost they will suffer people in the low 60s 70s like you know the really really stellar companies i won't name them of course you will see that uh, they will weather this quite well right uh, vikram i think uh, you rightly said that it's uh, the eventual value which has to be looked at in an enterprise and not really a uh, you know from a summation point of view of how much of my revenue will go up if i were to acquire a company uh, that's so important and also looking at slightly from a different lens as you said in terms of the different matrices what historically have been looked at uh, will make a difference in the investment scenario well in the interest of time uh, you know i would request all the panelists to kind of share um, uh, you know two 
key pointers you know when we are looking at uh, jump starting the industry back the auto industry back uh, very pointed to uh, you know two two pointers from each of you starting with amit yeah i think uh, a two point is a good uh, tough thing to kind of say that but i will say that let let's first focus on establishing a good base uh, because we are not in position to uh, grow fast second thing is uh, set the digitization in motion uh, with a very strong view of overall cost so automation uh, low cost or in office automation should be very uh, deeply looked in because this probably is a time where our uh, return on investment because of the social distancing may actually improve perfect how about you ramashankar i think i'll just respond to some of the points which i was picking up in between uh, when i was hearing to siddharth on the marketing side so we discussed regarding the car uh, and the vehicle uh, a possibility on the consumer preferences but look at what will happen with the you now uh, old cars you know um, people will find their cars the more time they will spend in cars uh, their own cars rather than shared mobility and i see for the aftermarket i think i saw some questions also in chat Uh, for aftermarket it can be a good opportunity because the more old cars will be on road number one number two the accessories you know because they would like to personalize the car rather than take a small car and have the happiness of the big car so that will definitely happen the other thing which i also um, um, picked up is on the uh, scrapage policy you know there can be a very good win 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 for everybody if the scrapage policy criteria is built on the fitness and the real fitness not the current corrupt fitness practices with rtos which goes on today this will first of all support the road safety on the road uh, you will have less accidents because the safer parts will go in because there is no uh, compliance or enforcement on that so if we have the public private partnership and we have the inspection regime and the scrapage policy merged together and then the fitness becomes the criteria you will see mushrooming employment coming up in aftermarket as well as the more cars will be sold for and those cars will be out which is not fit to uh, apply at the same time i also see that if you can combine this a lot of skilling will come back to how do you keep the cars fit and that is where uh, the the technician skilling the driver skilling and that that will come in forefront the other aspect what julian saw uh, to talk regarding the risk management and today if you look at how the the, the used car as well as the connected cars will become the norm because people are in fear they are, they have this uh, you know phobia they would like to have their families and friends connected they want to see them on video like today with the digitized world now this is mushrooming in aftermarket with non secured iot devices you have the uh, dongles and everybody selling bringing from china putting some application layer all of this can be hacked today more than few lakhs of cars can be stopped when they are at the speed of 80 it can be done you can disengage the brakes you can disengage the clutch uh, while they are on speed this can be done on remote now india needs and that is where the government needs to come in in place and make this policies in a way that the aftermarket i think the aftermarket has not got enough attention today aftermarket is part of the necessary necessity because you may defer buying a large car or a luxury car you cannot defer a repair uh, because of which you can have an accident or because of which you cannot fly on the road so i will see that as a major part the third thing which i i just picked up also from uh, you know while um, uh, we were speaking regarding scaling and the blue collar the element of trust you know uh, vivek uh, talked about few oems can have consolidation they can take tier one role but i personally don't feel so because the current situation where cost and the and everybody would like to have a variable cost so this is uh, contradictory you need variable cost you don't need to consolidate rather we will depend more and more on tier 1 tier 2 and tier 3 which means that we have to manage our weak links the weak links are tier 3 tier 2 tier 4 and the uh, blue collar workers and these two weak link really need from because the more you become smaller tier 2 tier 3 the environment of the business is more important the big oems can manage but the small uh, tier 1 uh, tier 2 tier 3 cannot manage that so is the entire value chain rama which you're talking exactly. about exactly so government right. has to come in role and i right. think government's role will increase there and we as the uh, auto industry must involve with government now to do something for them for both blue collar as well as for the tier 3 tier 2 tier 3. perfect perfect Mr. Tanija, from your side, I mean, any two point, a quick two pointers uh, from the finance side. 
uh, from the finance side, once the operations start with the OEMs, there could be a sense of unreasonable, unreasonableness, so to say, when the tier ones will be under pressure to supply the to to make the vehicles, and at that time, tier one, tier uh, tier two, tier three, tier four will be under more pressure. So there needs to be a mechanism to find money for them so that they can deliver back to them. Unless that happens, the whole chain will uh, collapse. And number two, uh, a motivation for the blue collar workers to get them back to start working. Maybe some financing support to them because they are all mostly contract labor. So these two from the finance angle to set the ball rolling and show going again. Perfect. Uh, Julian, from your point of view? So from my point of view, um, as we come out of this and we go back to a more businesses, new normal state, I think um, the automotive sector needs to focus more on continuous controls, monitoring and digitizing the very heavy manual bureaucratic controls frameworks today. Um, we still love our pieces of paper and signatures and we're not driving technology to push that forward for us, which will release time to do more important things for the manager and through continuous controls monitoring. And also there needs to be, the second point is a greater focus on risk management. So just going back to Ram's point on the connected car, you know, everybody thinks it's great having your car connected, but the cyber security involved in that is, is not figuring on people's radars. And with legislation coming in over data protection, it's in place in other parts of the world. It's coming to India. It's going to hit big style. Yeah. You have so much information about the person in the vehicle. And we need to really start focusing more on risk management and ensuring that we have appropriate control mechanisms around that that don't hinder the business, but enable the business to proceed at pace. Very true. So that finally from your side. Um... Okay. Um, so, you know, I think uh, not, not to repeat myself, but the policy issue that we spoke about, the fact that there needs to be some kind of a, stimulus from the government, that's probably the first thing that we'll have to watch for. But, uh, you know, on, on the OEM and on the component industry side, I, I think uh, having heard everybody speak today, I think that endorses the view uh, that, uh, yes, there is a tremendous opportunity within all of this problem. Um, and, you know, I think the way that everybody does their business will also change. The opportunity for the components, I mean, there's so much backlash against China, for example, uh, a lot of that business could shift to India. So it's about how people approach it. So the point Vivek was making earlier totally endorse that. But, uh, you know, about how everything changes in terms of how business is done in the automotive setup in, in the space, uh, you know, to Julianne's point about even just the way the employees are going to be treated, you know, the kind of work protocols that go into place. A lot of that is unknown. So I think those are some of the things I'd watch out for. From a consumer perspective, I think, uh, you know, how quickly a company or a brand moves uh, in terms of not just giving them the kind of vehicles that they're looking for, maybe, you know, more compacts, uh, but also, I think uh, the whole digital deployment of its uh, marketing as well as then customer servicing, uh, how quickly people get comfortable with that idea, because a lot of people may not want to go to a showroom anymore, but they still might want to do a test drive. What are those protocols? I think brands that use this, this particular aspect smartly will sh you know, stand to benefit greatly because digital communication as well will see a huge uplift. And uh, I think that's where consumers will be looking for information because we've all got used to it, right? We've got used to looking at our handhelds and not the morning paper anymore. True, okay. true, true. Thank you, thank you, Siddharth. I think uh, just to summarize, um, there are many key points which have come out and many thanks to all the panelists. And uh, uh, you know, I think uh, if you look at more from an industry standpoint, uh, one, digitization will hold the key and uh, the digitization in the across value chain, be it manufacturing, be it supply chain, be it customer interface. Second is in terms of uh, communication. Uh, when we talk about communication with all the stakeholders that will go up and we are already seeing uh, with respect to how OEMs have started communicating with their customers. Uh, the third and the very important aspect is on the risk management. So I think uh, the entire gamut of looking at business continuity planning more from a sustainability and risk management will will get uh, will get redefined at the organization level and finally um, you know to the point which that you talked about again in terms of um, 
uh, the, the reforms you know which you reiterated in your in your in your discussion about the policy reforms which is absolutely critical uh, my final uh, question to dr tim i mean how do you after hearing the india story i mean after hearing the experts of how india is looking at uh, coming back to operations from all the aspects be it the dealers be it the oems be it the component suppliers what are your thoughts what are your views how better we can do it further what else can be done in india thank you very much i think one key thing that we can't overemphasize enough is to focus on the people focus on the people in your organization during this time um they're in unknown territory just like we are as leaders in the organization and so it's important to make sure that we're giving back to them during this time and understanding their needs using some of the examples that i shared in the introduction comments about what some of the chinese auto manufacturers have been doing as well so uh remain people focused is my key point with this we'll come to an end of uh, the webinar again many thanks to all of you uh for sharing your insights practical insights uh, you know these are very useful and i'm sure our audience also found it absolutely useful um we we'll we hopefully we have been able to uh, take uh, most of the questions which came across on the chat box but in case not uh, we'll try to attempt uh, to make an attempt of answering all the questions in an offline mode thank you very much and thank have a have a good day ahead